Hey, um, is this where Bible study is happening today? Sure is. But ain't many of us, but where two or three are gathered, though. Is that Matthew 18? Yeah. Let me show you what that means. I'm sure this has happened to you before. You've misused a Bible verse in the wrong context, or you've heard someone do it themselves. Hey, I'll admit I've done this before. It's such a common thing because it's tied to Christian culture, but Christian culture should be rooted in biblical truth. That's why I wanted to bring to your attention today three commonly misquoted verses I hear all the time. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I often hear this verse misused for motivation or encouragement, when in fact it's about contentment. I've seen it on athlete sneakers, tattoos, t-shirts, I mean it's everywhere. Usually people keep it as a reminder during difficult situations or as they pursue challenging goals. The verse encourages them that God is empowering them in their endeavors and will give them the strength to make it through their situations. When Paul wrote this in Philippians, he was imprisoned in Rome. He was wrapping up his letter to the church by sharing what he had learned about contentment. Paul was sharing that he can be content regardless of his situations, or in other words, through all circumstances that he's placed in. It says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So take a moment to think about that. Paul is saying I can be content regardless of my situation. When commonly this phrase is used to communicate that God is gonna empower me to achieve whatever I put my mind to. So this verse serves as encouragement, especially for those going through difficulty to remind them that God is with you. So it's not about God bringing us to a goal, but more about God's promise to keep us and get us through whatever he brings us to. Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. This verse I usually hear quoted as encouragement to one another when there's like low church attendance in a worship service, or maybe given as a benediction during a prayer meeting to emphasize the power we have in coming together in fellowship. And if some people are really reaching, they might use this to justify not going to a church building because they're in their home, there are two or three with them. But did you know that this verse is talking about God's presence and support during church discipline? The two or three referenced in the scripture are not coming together for a prayer meeting or a Bible study, but they've brought an offense to someone and now they're escalating it. Verse 15 says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church and if they still refuse, treat them as a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bound on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything, they ask for it. It will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. The author is comforting those believers by reassuring them that through this process of church discipline, of identifying sin and addressing sin, God is working, even if it doesn't seem to work out. Matthew 7, 1, do not judge so that you won't be judged. You probably haven't heard it in that exact phrasing, but this is where we get that common saying, only God can judge me. People usually use this as a way to say, you know, you can't disapprove of what I'm doing, you don't have the right to tell me what to do. It's kind of like this pass to do whatever you want. And even though Matthew 7, 1 translates to judge not that you may not be judged, if you continue reading the chapter, you'll find that it's not about never judging, but it's rather how you judge. Jesus is offering a posture and an order for judging others in order to avoid self-righteousness. So let's take a look at it. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. 
And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? It's like this notion of if you point a finger at someone, there's three pointing back at you. Our judgment in regards to others, sometimes it's wrong, especially if we're inconsistent in how we apply our moral standards. It's easier to judge someone else while giving yourself more leniency and more grace, but that's also hypocritical. It's a double standard and it's what should be avoided according to the text. The Christian is called to show unconditional love, but the Christian is not called to show unconditional approval. And we saw that when we were talking about Matthew 18. We are called to judge doctrine and action, to call out sin as sin is passing judgment. But that also means we're agreeing with God. When we hear this verse, we should be challenged to self-evaluation. It's a prompt to first ask, have I done the work of self-examination confession, repentance, removing that log in my eye before I call out someone else's shortcomings. Because the goal of calling out is not humiliation, but restoration. I can't do that if I'm still living in sin or struggling with the same thing that I'm calling out in someone else's life. So I know it's gonna be hard to stop using some of these common phrases because it's so natural. It's like second nature. But hopefully now, as you hear this, you can at least think, Okay, now I know the context and I can be mindful moving forward.